Heavenly Father, God, as we, we just come before your throne, Lord, as we lift up our prayers as an aroma, sweet aroma to you, God. Lord, I pray for every heart that's in this room. Lord, I pray for every heart of every woman who is listening to this teaching, God. I pray, Lord, that you soften their hearts, Lord, and that you give them a moment in time just before they even open up these scriptures, that you just give them a moment in time to go, Lord, I surrender all I am to you. God, I want to know you, I want to hear you, and I want to follow you. And I pray, God, this is the the cry of every woman's heart in this room. They just want to know you more. And Lord, as we look at the fullness of just your, the, the, of what is to come, the future um, of these judgments, God, I pray right now, Father, that you help us have the right lens and the right perspective, God. Lord, that you protect our minds and our thoughts that are fleshy. You protect our minds and our thoughts of the things of the enemy, God. And you give us a biblical view, Lord, that you show us biblically what you are doing and why, God that we can trust you, that we can honor you through it, God, and we can then, after all of these things, we can then have an urgency and a passion to share with every single person who will listen. So God, I pray right now you fill us with your spirit. You empty me personally of everything that's in me, God. Lord, this mouth is yours. This vessel is yours. Holy Spirit, I pray that you just come and you fill and you overflow, God, so that you are honored and you are glorified. And every word that I say, God, has come straight from you, that it is not of me. And Lord, we walk away glorifying you and praising you, God. Thank you for your word and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's go quickly over the first five verses that we covered last time. As we enter into um, chapter 8, it says, When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Okay, so remember from chapter 7, there was worship and praise unto the Lord. And then it goes right into 8. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. All right, so here we go into the trumpets. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add to it the prayers of all the saints. If you do not underline all, underline all. All the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense ascended from the angel's hand with prayers of the saints before God. Verse five says, and then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and hurled it to the earth. And there were pearls of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. So before we continue on in verse six, I want to, I want to, as I was going through, just preparing for this next section, again, just going back over, looking at the fact that these prayers were filled with the fire. Okay, so think about this last verse. Listen to that again. He took the censer filled with the fire of the altar and hurled it to the earth. He threw it to the earth. And there were pearls of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. So these prayers, what does that tell you about the prayers of all the saints? What does it tell you? It's powerful, right? This was almost used as like a, a weapon, right? Because he, look at that, look at that. that. That's a picture of the power of prayer, okay? What God is doing is taking these prayers. He's hearing these prayers. Remember we talked about the the beauty of the incense being like smoke and aroma to the Lord. But he's using these things to go, I'm going to give them, again, remember, we think of this weapon, but ultimately, could God have wiped out every bit of human, the human race, <laughs> the earth as a whole in one second? Yes, he could have. But this is only just a tiny bit, right? Remember, we see a third upon a third upon a third upon a third. He was giving them grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So even in this, it's like, yes, I hear you, but I'm going to get their attention, right? I'm going to get their eyes focused on me. Because ultimately, it's coming, eternity is coming very, very soon. Okay, so before we get into the next part, um, 
of verse 6. I want us to make sure the lens in which we look through is clear. Okay, remember when we talked about the judgment and the justice of God. When we understand the judgment of God, when we understand the justice of God, the cross then makes perfect sense. Why is that? Why is that? Right, there had to be a perfect substitution, right? There had to be a payment for that sin. Judgment is absolutely necessary. And the one who escapes it only escapes it because of their faith in the one who chose not to escape it. Do you hear that? The one who escapes it only escapes it because of the faith in the one who chose not to escape it, which is Christ himself. This whole process in our minds of thinking how staggering it is to think that God imputed, think about that, imputed, which means put on, okay, imputed wickedness, my wickedness, your wickedness, imputed wickedness, why? On Christ, okay, disciplining him, chastising him for my sin, for your sin, okay, It's staggering to think about this. And then imputed Christ's righteousness on me, rewarding me for his sacrifice. That's that's not fair, right? That's unfathomable grace. That's the gospel in a nutshell. But justice had to be fulfilled, and that was fulfilled on Christ. So that's unfathomable grace. Grace, that grace is the lens which we need to look through to see the coming judgments of the trumpets and the bowls. If you don't look through it with the eyes of grace, you are are at the risk, listen to me, you are at the risk of judging God based on circumstances you don't understand. Do you hear me? This is where people go, ah, the Hebrew, the Revelation reminds me of the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is no different than the God of the New Testament, Okay? But this is a misconception among believers all over the place because they don't understand his grace. If you look at God's judgment through the lens of anything else but his grace, you are at the risk of judging God based on circumstances you don't understand. We are human, okay? We're never going to see, never going to know because we're not God every in and out of the entirety of what he's painting and putting together. There's no way we can. This is unfathomable, unfathomable grace. Okay, so let's look at, look at verse 6. We talked about this a little bit. It says, in the seven angels who had the seven trumpets, remember seven? Perfection and completion, right? The seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. Okay, remember they had to prepare themselves. What do we talk about? How, what in the world took place at that time? Can you imagine the angels having to go, they're seeing what is coming and they have to prepare themselves for this. What in the world do you think they thought? Because think about it. Yeah. Holy moly. And this is just the beginning, right? But think about it. There was, a, there was a half an hour. Remember we took a pause for like 30 seconds? <laughs> We were all like, this is really uncomfortable. Um, 30 seconds, 30 minutes, an hour, what was it? 30 minutes of like full on silence in heaven. And then they were given this. And they had to prepare themselves for what was about ready to take place. So we have this first trumpet, okay? The first sounded and there was hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled to the earth and a third of the earth was burned up. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. All right, so what do we have? First trumpet. Okay, in your chart, if you have your chart with you, make sure when the first trumpet, you write in, hail, fire mixed with blood. Here we are with the third. A third of the earth burned up. A third of the trees burned up. All green grass burned up. Okay, this was so cool because on Wednesday night, 
I already had this cross-reference because I had no idea how many chapters he was going to go through. But <laughs> Wednesday night, we covered Exodus 9. And let's just, if, you're, if you have your Bibles, which you should, go ahead and go with me to Exodus 9. We, it's just incredible, the timing of God. Exodus 9, 22. Okay, so in the context of this, Moses is going before Pharaoh and saying, let my people go, right? If you don't, there's judgments that are going to be coming. All right, 22 says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that hail may fall on the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down from the earth. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. And it was very severe, such as had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck all that was in the field through, through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And hail was also struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. Only in the land of, of Goshen were the sons of Israel where there was no hail. So see, do you see the parallel here, here? Can you see the comparison of this? What do we see here? Go back to Revelation 8. Okay, the first one's down. There was hail, mixture of fire, and with blood. The same exact thing we see on Egypt. And what does it say in the last verse, what I just read? Only in the land of, God, of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were there, where, they, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. So what did God do to the Israelites? He protected them, didn't he? We're going to see God does the same thing for us. Judgment of the physical world around them. You can see these, these first bit of these trumpets are on the physical world, okay? The tangible things, the things that they see. And I believe this is judgment of the physical world around them so that they will look to the things that are not physical, right? The things that are eternal. That is always God's heart. Think about every time, any struggle that you go through, any, any problem, any fire, any, anything that is a trial, what is God doing? What is he doing? Lifting our eyes up. What else? Okay, he's refining us. Yeah. He's getting our attention, right? Why does he have to use trial? Why? We're self-centered, stupid sheep, <laughs> right? We, we would never, ever say, yeah, you know what, God? We're just going to keep our eyes up. Everything's great here. Everything's awesome. But I'm going to keep my eyes up here. No, God has to do those things so that he, we realize, man, we, for one, we are not God, right? We are not in control. We don't know everything. We can't fix everything. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> we can't, right? It's designed to get our eyes focused on him, okay? And it's designed to make us dependent on him. That's, that's really what the most beautiful uh, fruit that is produced through suffering is utter dependence on the Lord, okay? Because when we're dependent on the Lord, what happens? What happens when we're dependent on the Lord? Total less dependence on self, which produces what? If we don't, if we're not dependent on the Lord, we make ourselves God. But when we do depend on the Lord, what does that produce? Fruit that is eternal, right? Things that matter for eternity. It's not just about here. He's always after our heart and get to get our eyes up, because we're going to be spending the rest of eternity there, right? Giving that eternal perspective. This is grace. All right, so we see this a third. We've talked about this quite a bit. A third means a, a part or a portion, okay? But not a major part. We must not take the phrase a third part, okay, from this, this whole picture as being a bigger part. A third is what? What percentage is a third? 33.33, what, what percent? Okay, it's just, it's just a part, and he's doing this for a reason. He's doing this to get their attention. 
A third is mentioned 12 times here, okay? 12 can be found 187 places in Scripture. Revelation alone has 22 occurrences of the number, okay? The meaning of 12, it symbolizes God's power and God's authority, as well as serving as a perfect governmental foundation that symbolizes completeness or the nation of Israel as a whole. Remember, we talked about the 144,000. We got 12 tribe, 12,000 from every tribe, 12 tribes. All right. Okay, again, we can go over. Could he have wiped out everything all at one time? Yes, but he didn't. See, with the lens and the eyes of grace, it's very vital we understand that. If we just focus, this is like in our own life. I'm sure personally, none of you have this issue but me. But when you go through life and go through things, it's so much easier for me to focus on the the 5% that's not well than the 95% that's well. Is that, is that just me? <laughs> Amen, right? All of us, right? We, we, it's so much easier to look at the things that need improvement or need change, right? Okay, well, that's good when there's sin involved. But when, but when things are go, just life and what's going on, we can spend so much time focusing on just that 5%. See, here, if it's the same thing in parallel, because if we can look at looking at the judgment of God and going, holy cow, what is this going to be? Like hail and blood and fire. We can look at this one-third and make this one-third the whole picture and miss the heart of God altogether. Okay, the whole phrase, missing the forest of the trees, it's similar, right? We have to look at the whole picture and the heart of God. Why do I push so hard? Know who your God is. It's not cliche, and trust me, I've said it enough that it'll be on my tombstone, (laughs) you know? But that is the thing. Why do I say that? Why do I push that? Why do I encourage y'all to do that? It's not for my benefit. Why? That's right, so that it's easier to trust the God of my circumstances than to judge the God based on my circumstances, right? When I run to God in the midst of a trial or a struggle that's meant to push my eyes up, okay, to go, God, I don't feel it, I don't know it, I don't understand it, but I know who you are. So therefore, that is the lens to which I will look through every situation I walk through. No matter what, it is good because he is good. He is good. But to the logic and the world and our minds, you go, man, this happened to me and this happened to me. You know what? I get it, me too. And it's terrible and it's wrong. But man, what if, what if that was the very condition that God needed for you to run to the throne room and to depend on him wholly? Was it worth it? And I guarantee you, when you stand before God, the day you take your last breath or you're caught up in the air, you will be thankful that that thing happened. If you're not thankful already. Amen? It's huge. It's huge. But this is the thing we have to understand. And if you want to write this at the top of your list, at the top of your chart, God will do whatever it takes. He will do whatever it takes to get my attention and to capture my heart, okay? And still, guess where are we going to be right now? We're in in heaven, but these are the people that are still on this earth, and he's still doing whatever it takes to get their attention. He still is. But we don't want to wait till this time, right? We don't want to have to go through this, and we don't have to. This should give us great comfort, though, of those jars that are in the back, the names of every person we've put in those jars. Every Wednesday, when we come together and we pray for every lost friend and relative and loved one, it should give us great comfort that God is still doing whatever it takes to get their attention. He hears our prayers. They're that sweet aroma, and they're in the throne room. They are before God the Father himself. Take comfort in those things, but he wishes absolutely None should perish. Ezekiel 33, 11 says this. I will put it in your root work. We're going to have a lot of cross-references tonight. So there's some stuff I want you to turn with me. There are other things. Just write it down or trust and know that you'll get it in the root work. Then uh, make sure you print that out and do it. 
this next couple weeks. All right, so Ezekiel 33, 11 says, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure at all in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then should you die, house of Israel? Second Peter 3, 9 says this, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That is the heart of our God, and those are the glasses you need to put on. Whenever you start to doubt his goodness, put on 2 Peter 3, 9. Put it on. When it, that, and that, that is the number one thing that the enemy wants to do. Okay, you go back to Genesis. The very first thing God, that the enemy did to Adam and Eve, or really to Eve, was she made, he made her doubt God's goodness. Because when you doubt God's goodness, you're going to doubt the word of God. You're going to doubt the authority of God. And then you're going to, again, judge God based on your circumstances. Okay, but if you go back and, nope, I know who my God is, I will not budge. You will, I will not budge. We have to look at the bigger picture. We have to see things in the counsel and the context of God. If we do not, this is the other thing, we will have a very hard time trusting God and his timing. That's another thing. So we can easily go, okay, okay, we're holding on, holding on. If he seems really, really slow, <laughs> you know, sometimes, but we have to trust. God is God and I am not. And this brings in, um, I was looking, there's a book and I, I've, I've suggested this book to many, not in place of, but beside um, your quiet time. But it's, it's called um, Calm My Anxious Heart by Linda Dillow. I am... It's a very, very good book. And it's not just about being anxious. It's, not, it's really about perspective and biblical perspective. Um, like I said, it's beside quiet time. Please don't replace it with quiet time. Um, but I say that, and it's a very, very, um, it, it's just phenomenal of how she wrote it. Um, she actually lives in Monument, Colorado, and she is, her story is, is phenomenal. But if you haven't read it, uh, Calm My Anxious Heart by Linda Dillow. Um, and, and in, anyways, I was, I was going through it this week because I had referred it to someone, um, and we were talking about it, and I was just telling her, this is so good, just giving perspective. But I loved this, these two questions that she put in there, which was perfect for, of course, tonight. But it, it, these are the same thing, but the emphasis is different. Can you trust God? Okay, so there's this question of, can you trust God? Okay, is basically what it's saying is, is he trustworthy or is he dependable? Okay, can you trust God? The emphasis is on trust. And then the second one is, can you trust God? So the first one is, he trustworthy? Is he dependable by his nature and his attributes? Is he trustworthy? That's one. But then, now that we have established, yes, he's trustworthy. Yes, he's dependable. This is a deeper question. This is one that... Sometimes it's easy just to, to, to mouth off the right answer without looking at the depths of your own heart to decide and see, do I really trust him? Okay, do I really? So can you trust God? Is your relationship and confidence so solid that you trust him no matter what? See, that's a little bit more of a difficult question, isn't it? See, it goes from the intellectual to the heart. I can intellectually say he's trustworthy and dependable because I know what it, the word says. But see, knowing what the word said is, says is vital, but it's necessary to take what you know about the word and allow that not to just be something you intellectually understand, but something that you fully live out. You receive wholeheartedly. Okay, if you, if you struggle with it, I would ask you, how is your control barometer? <laughs> Okay, how, how, are you, how do you deal with, do you, do you thrive in lack of control? <laughs> or do you white knuckle it, okay? How, how, what, what do you do when things feel out of control? You know what I'm saying? Different things to so just ask yourself so that you can examine your heart. This is going to be in your root work, so you won't be able to get away from it. 
So, but these are things that are, it's necessary. You got to know where you're at. It's easy to trust God when things are going good. Just like it's easy to praise him when things are going good. But when you're in the darkest place of your life and you're struggling, man, what do you do then? How's your trust barometer? Who's your first who do you first cry out to? Cry out to God. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? All right, let's look at verse eight. Here we go, and here's number two. So on your charts, you will put for your trumpet, second trumpet. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire, was hurled into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. All right, so second trumpet. A third, here we go again, a third of the sea, just a part of it. Some believe, I mean, you go through and you go, which obviously I'm I'm not a scholar nor a theologian, but you go through all of what they've, they've put on this verse, and man, there's so many of them that try to explain there's a, a physical, you know, meteorite did it, or this happened, or this, you know, trying to tangibly, humanly explain what is going on here. But ultimately, I mean, I'm just like, if God can speak the world into existence, he can speak the world into destruction. <laughs> Do we really need to analyze and look at every time you de- we'll get lost through that we'll kind of miss we'll major on minors that don't really matter god is god he's outside of our human brain to understand if it's a meteorite or if it's a breath it doesn't matter and when it says something like a great mountain i interpret it as something like a great mountain <laughs> burning with fire it burns with fire right um just taking it literal but this reminds me go back to exodus Seven, which is it's just so cool how God works. And remember, even looking at how this parallels the, the plagues with the judgments and looking at how God judges or, or desires to get man's attention, remember the overall view of the, of the Israelites. What was his goal? What was he doing? He was pulling out his people, right? He was taking them out of captivity, He was setting them free. Look at chapter 7. We're going to look at 19 and 20. So, then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch it out, stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, and over their pools, and over all the reservoirs of the water, that they may become blood, and they will be blood throughout the land of Egypt, both in the vessels of wood and the vessels of stone. So we're going to see here, as we look at this, of what is fully being destroyed, which parallels this perfectly, okay? So let's keep going on this. Number nine, verse nine, and go back to Revelation. A third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. All right, so what do we see here? We see a mountain thrown down like fire into where? The sea, which we paralleled to the, the, of the waters turning to blood, the waters being destroyed. A third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Okay, remember again, a third, a third, a third, a third. God's grace, God's grace, God's grace, God's grace. I was looking at this stuff and, and looking at like 80%, like we think about trees and uh, oxygen and all that thing, but 80% of our oxygen actually comes from the sea, the plankton in the sea. Isn't that crazy? Or the, yeah. Isn't that crazy? I didn't know that. Just a little tidbit of a tool, like, doesn't really matter. But, <laughs> but you can see like, okay, as God's doing these things, a third of that is being destroyed. Again, it's like, look up, look up, look up. All right, let's look at verse 10. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs and waters. 11. The star is named Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died from the waters because they were made bitter. Okay, so here in verse 11, we see this name Wormwood. 
Okay, this word wormlet, what, wormwood is a plant found in the Middle East, and it's known for its bitter taste. Okay, it's a term, um, is figurative for bitterness. It's mentioned seven times in the Old Testament. Imagine that. Seven times in the Old Testament where it represents sorrow and bitter judgment. I will give you every cross-reference to that in your root work, okay? So you can go through and look at every area of where this wormwood was mentioned. But I'm going to take you to Exodus. You go back to Exodus 15. And this is just so cool. 15, we're going to do, go to um, verse 22. Exodus 15, 22. It says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they, were, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. <laughs> when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. So the people grumbled as, at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statue and regulation, and there he, te he tested them. And he said, If, underline that, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commands and keep his statutes, I will put none of the disease on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there was 12 springs of water and 70, look at that, 12, <laughs> and 70 date palms, and they camped there beside the waters. Okay, so we see this picture. Here in Revelation, we, we're seeing this wormwood, which where they get Mara. It's the same, it's the same thing, that bitterness or that, um, it's mal, like bitter. And so we see in Revelation where God is taking the water that was clean and he's what? Making it bitter. But before we see in Exodus what? It was bitter. And what made it clean? The tree. What does the tree represent? The cross. Okay, going back, look at how beautiful this is. When he says here, they went how long? Three days. Every time you see three in scripture, what is it a picture of? What? Resurrection, okay, where man has new life. Okay, from, it's a, the number of man, man has new life through resurrection. Okay, three days on, in the, the belly of a whale, three days in the tomb. So you're going to see these things, but after the three days, when you see three days in Scripture, afterwards, there's a resurrection. There's a, a hope afterwards, okay? So when you look at that, three days in the wilderness and found no water. <laughs> Who's the water? When they came to Mara, bitter, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Ugh. Okay, then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. Okay, through the cross comes the water of what? Of life, right? Through the water of life. Only through the cross can you get, not have to go through the wormwood of the bitterness of water later on in Revelation, okay, during this tribulation period. The cross is the way out, okay? But then we see here, they cry out to the Lord. Okay, there he made um, a statue regulation and tested them, and he said, this is huge. If you will give earnest heed, I love this phrase of earnest heed. It's like, what do you think of when you think of earnest? genuine, right? Like full on, like you have all of all of me, okay? There's nothing being held back. This earnest heed, heed understanding, okay? I'm going to submit everything I am to you. So if you give a earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, okay? There's obedience. When you give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord, through the word of God, through the spirit of God, you obey his commands, give ear to his commandments, and keep his statutes. Then what? 
I will put none of the diseases on which I have put on the Egyptians. What is this a picture of? I will put none of the judgments and the wrath that I will put on the earth. It's a, do you guys see how cool this is? It is a beautiful picture of the salvation and deliverance so we don't have to go through these things. And it's only through what? The wood, right? The cross. It's only through the cross can we have clean water through the water of life. The water of life. This contrast is beautiful. I was looking at this and I'm just like, ah, it's insane how God puts every tiny detail. When you're going through Exodus 15, you're not thinking about the whole fact of what he's going to reveal in this whole wormwood and bitterness that's going to happen in Revelation. But man, that's why I say this 500 dimensional puzzle that you can be so lost and enthralled in if you just take the plunge to heed earnestly the Lord and his word earnestly. And that's the key. So many times people are like, yeah, I read. And I, yeah, you know, the biggest thing is like, how desperate are you for him? He says, seek me with all of your heart. You know how many times people tell me all the time, I didn't read that. I didn't get that. Sit for a while. Look at every word. Digest it for just a little bit. God will reveal himself to you in the most beautiful ways but you have to earnestly seek him. You can't go, oh, I read it, it's done. He didn't speak to me, so whatever. I got a lot to do today. Guess what? He won't do it. He won't do it. He's not a genie. He's not. He's a God who wants a relationship with us just because he's so stinking good. But we can miss this 500-dimensional puzzle by not being in here by not sitting at his feet, by not earnestly seeking him with our whole heart. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. Sometimes you have to sit there and not budge until he speaks. God blesses that obedience. Blesses. I, rem- I literally remember where I was sitting the very first time, way back in Florida, in our office. And I remember acquiring so much knowledge and so much revelation where it was just like, wow, this is so cool. But I remember the moment I was dealing with something and I don't even remember what it was. Of course, it doesn't really matter. But I remember when I was dealing with something and I remember that moment where I finally understood surrender, (laughs) like full on surrender. Like I give up God, like overwhelming peace and, and joy and like holy cow, this is what it means. <laughs> like, but just sitting there and allowing the spirit of God to move and work. I didn't have discipleship. I, don't know, I just went through and did what we did. But man, when you see that it is so very simple, so very simple to experience the fullness of God, we are the ones that make it complicated. We do. When we think, okay, well, you know, I got to know this and do No, all you got to know is he is God and surrender everything you are to him. Know the the process of the gospel through the lamb and the perfect, perfect switcheroo that took place. Praise him, worship him. You will experience him. You will. And you will, I mean, I'm telling you, it's like, it's like you want more and more. And the only thing that's required is quick repentance. The only thing that's required is swift surrender. And you experience more and more and more of him. It's not complicated. It's not. And sometimes, like I said, you got to sit there. You got to say, Lord, I'm, you're like Jacob, I'm not going to budge until you speak. I'm not going to move until you show me. I'm not going to, I, what does he say? I want, show me your blessing. Give me your blessing. And we so in our human idiocracy think that that blessing is a tangible thing. That blessing is his presence. It's his presence. It's his hand that we can follow. So look at this this contrast between the wood in Ezekiel and the cross and the fullness of this, this wormwood that then was cast down again. Who does that tell you? What does that tell you about your God? What does everything I just said tell you about your God? Nothing. He wants a relationship. What else? (laughs) 
Yes. Yeah. He's the ultimate craftsman. Right? What else? He's intentional. Yeah. What else? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I think throughout my time walking with the Lord, I think those, those are one of those verses that you kind of take for granted until you start seeing the fullness of, wow, he is the way. And there's probably no other way you can describe him. You know what I'm saying? Like in the fullness of like all the details he puts together to make sure that you see him. Does that make sense? Like it's so much more profound to me than it was years ago. The way, the truth, the light, the life. And he, a light too, and the water, okay, that never runs dry. So what does that require of us, okay? What did he, he did, when you talk about what he did for us, but look at what does that require of us? Once we know that God is intentional, that he is, he's not reckless, that he, what? What else do we say? He's awesome. He's done everything. What does that require of us? Total and 100% devotion, right? Total and 100% trust. Goes back to that question, do you trust God? When you look at the attributes of him and you see these pictures come together, guys, like, this is amazing. Go all the way to Exodus. We're in the middle of Revelation and you're seeing these, these, this merge of the ultimate tapestry. You know, have you ever seen that, that analogy when you look at the backside of a tapestry and it's like crazy? And then you turn it around and you see things as how, how they really are and it's this most beautiful tapestry. He's putting together all of these pieces of these puzzles and we get to get glimpses of it. Can you imagine when we stand before him to see the fullness of what he's done? Even his character, the cross itself, the gospel, boom. I don't think, I don't know. We can't contain it here. That's why we don't know. But I'm just like, I can't, I can't wait to see it all. I can't wait to see it all. But those are the things that are, that are important as you look at every scripture. Who is my God here? What does this tell me about his character? Then what does that tell me about what he did? What does that, what is it? You guys are going to hear this till the day I die. How does what? How does that define me? Okay? And then that determines what I do. If we as women of God can get that down, we will be the most free, the most just pliable, usable, moldable vessel on the planet. And every woman around you will crave that because she lives in constant insecurity and condemnation. You know it because you were it. And if you still are it, go back and do your who is God journal for every single scripture. I'm telling you, it will give you the confidence of who you are in Christ to not be so dependent on your confidence, but to be 100% dependent on his. It's vital. It's vital. All right, verse 12, we have the fourth Trumpet. So the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night the same way. All right, so what is it now? We're still looking at the effects on the physical world. Again, if the stars, the sun, the moon are struck, a third of it, not all of it, a third of it. What does that require? What does that do? <laughs> Practically darkness. What would that think about? It? If a third of our sun was uh, the, the stars, yeah, cold. Yeah, I know, but it is. <laughs> We're gonna get there. <laughs> ah! But think about that. When the stars, the moon, the sun, a third of that is. Darken, what does that require you practically? <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Like the waters, it's, it's the, the mountain of fire. That doesn't get your attention. What? <sighs> Look up. There's something else out there that is bigger than me. Who is in control? Prayerfully, they will go, it's not me. <laughs> you get right? I need to run to the one who is. 
Again, this is to get their attention. So third sun, third moon, third stars. So a day would not shine for a third of it, and a night the same way, like Alaska. All right, (laughs) this is just a glimpse of what happens when just a little bit of light is gone, just a little bit of light. We get a glimpse of how it will look when the one who holds all things together. Think about that. When we talk about an atom, you know, the God atom that they can't explain, that God is literally holding all things together. When he starts to take away, what does that do? What is our, what is our source of light? This is kind of cool. I want to, if you want to go there with me, go. If not, um, actually just go if you have it. Genesis chapter 1. We see this is the fourth, this is the, the, the fourth trumpet. Let's look at the fourth day of creation, okay? These are kind of one of those cool things. Here again, let's go through the puzzle. Okay, look at Genesis 1, 14. I'm going to read through 19. It says, Then God said, Let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was everything, and there was evening and there was morning on the fourth day. So we this parallel, going back to Revelation 8, the fourth day of creation, he created light and it was good, right? Now we see this parallel into the source of, third of the source of light being taken out, being taken out. So going through scripture, immediately our first thought is, okay, wait a minute, light. What do we know about light in scripture? Who is the source of light? Jesus is, okay, John 8, 12 says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know how powerful that would be during that time period? Okay, how powerful. John 3, this was also on Sunday. I'm just like, you can't make this stuff up. But look at John 3. Right after John 3, 16. Yeah, exactly. Yep, all these Billy Graham sermons. Okay, John 3, let's look at 18. It says, he who believes in him, talking about Jesus, is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the one begot, the only begotten son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and man loved darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that he, his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So what is that saying there? Who's the source of light? Okay, and what does it say about man's heart? Loves darkness rather than light, right? But he is the light. We see too in First John one five, you can write it down, but it will be in your root work. First John one five says, "This message we have heard and announced to you: God is light, and in Him there is no darkness." Habakkuk three four says, "His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays of flashing from His hand, and there is no hiding of His power." Okay, what else do you think of when you hear light? We know God is a source of light. We know Jesus is light. What else? What else is light? What? Life? Yes. It exposes darkness. Who, who else is the light? The church is the light, right? The church. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father in heaven. The whole point of us to be used by God is for what? For them to see your good works and what? Glorify God. Glorify God. We see Christ himself as the light. We see God as the light displaying his power. Christ displaying the way and for us to glorify God. See, the whole fullness of what God designed in light was very powerful. So when he's taking away third, a third, just a little, just a little, just a little, again, it requires them, which it should, to look up. In Revelation, we're going to see that in Revelation 16, all of it's going to be gone. But we're in chapter what? Eight. So we see the process of God's grace through, between this and, and 16. Why doesn't God just wipe them all out now? Mm-hmm. And he's done, it's exactly grace. He's done absolutely everything from the cross all the way through, the warnings so that they would not have to experience this. Okay, so we're going to camp a little bit on verse 13 too. Let's go there. What? We don't know. We, yeah, we're at parallels. Some people believe that, but it doesn't say in Scripture, so we don't know. The only thing we can do, and we don't know how many time, how much time period is even between the, like we, we know there's interludes, so we know that there's a specific time before the trumpets go, so we don't see that the trumpets and the bulls are happening at the exact same time. We don't see that in Scripture. Can it happen? Uh, we don't know, because we're not God. But... Mm-hmm. It's not the same event. So the seals, the bulls, and trumpets, they're all different. They're all, but we don't know. We just know this angel, then this angel, then this angel, then this angel blows this trumpet, this trumpet. We don't know. We will, <laughs> but we don't know. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's still light. Mm hmm. Darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's so true. And and I think it's both. I think because it's saying a third of the sun, a third of the moon, the third of the stars, and then a third of the dark, the, the night in the day. So of being a third. So I think even when it's day, it's still a third dimmed, like you're saying. And, and last time we talked about, you know, the times when you're in school and a teacher comes and shuts off the light in the classroom, like, what does that do? Whew. You know, it's like that gets your attention to where we, you have to look up. But yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for saying Yep. 
Yeah. 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 Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. And Pharaoh being the picture, too, of the human heart during this time, where it's like, okay, okay, I'll repent, I'll go to, no, I, I'm just kidding. You know, you know, when, on Wednesday night, if you guys were here, the most powerful part of what we were going, for me, looking at this, and I was just like, wow, it is he, he repent, he fake repented, didn't really repent, when there was relief. The moment that there was relief, and I was like, man, isn't that so a stinking stupid sheep? <laughs> you know, but that's that reality of like, that's why God allows these things to happen. Every single problem we have in our life, man, consider it grace, consider it grace. Because on our own, we would naturally be like, yeah, we're good. You know, we have that tendency where it's like, yeah, it's not a big deal. You know, it's the same thing. But it's, I was thinking the same, the same thing what you were saying too, like when the restrainer's taken away. You know, we, the world doesn't understand or realize every good and perfect gift is from above. When that restrainer's taken away and the light is being darkened, they have no idea what is good and what's not. They're going to see what's good and what's not good right? What's of God and what's not. It's powerful. Anything else on that? Go ahead. No, nope, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then there was a Ferris heart. Yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Mm hmm And look at how, do you guys notice, too, the magicians we talked about, too, with the, the first horseman of the apocalypse with being the Antichrist and how he mimics Christ and the Egypt. I mean, this is a handprint of the enemy to mimic Christ, mimic God, try to do what God does. Um, it, it's just like he doesn't, he doesn't change. <laughs> like, you know, his tactics are not new. You know, it's the same throughout. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. You're, you're painting a picture of what this is going to be like. Look at how much fear was set in people on, in a, of a virus that, that's going around. Can you imagine when these tangible things right before their eyes are being taken away and the fear that will set in and the way that man... So, I mean, you go to a garage sale and you can see, you, you can find women fighting over something nobody ever even wants just because somebody else wants it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like elbows get raw. You know, you, that's the human nature. It's like, wow, he wants, I better get it. We're running out of toilet paper. We better get as much toilet paper as we possibly can. You know what I mean? It's like <gasps> this fear of lack of, you know, resources. And you're painting a picture of exactly, exactly it. It's going to be, huh? We had a taste of, of, yeah, no imports. I mean, it's just like we're seeing the chaos and, and what's going to do to relationships. Look what it's going to do, you know. And starving spiritually. Yeah. And what do people do when they're desperate? I mean, can you imagine the crime rates are going to go up? I mean, every single, everything we can Mm-hmm. Yep. And he could have wiped them all out with the, but he's saying, I wish none would perish. I wish none would perish. Turn to me, turn to me, turn to me over and over again. Yeah. 
Yeah, water. He's the water. He is the I am. And they have to come to a point where they receive it. Yep. All right, verse 13. It says, Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in the mid heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, you should underline these, <laughs> woe, woe, woe to those who live on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. And these are different words too, Catherine, like you were saying. These are the remaining. There's a sequence here. You know, the, just the words that they use tell us there's some type of sequence in, in this order. Um, huh? Then. Yeah, then. But, okay, let's look at here. All the other trumpets here were, were blown by who? Angels. And now we have what? I heard an eagle. Okay, you're going to want to write this down. An eagle is biblical representation of God's protection, God's handiwork, and God's power. Okay? God's protection, God's handiwork, and God's power. All right, we're going to look at a few verses. You could spend all day here looking at eagles and how just amazing it is throughout all of Scripture. But I'm going to, I'm going to display it into two different categories. The first one I'm going to talk about is, is displaying God's power and, and warning through his handiwork, okay? God's power and, and warning. Jeremiah 49.22. You can look up, but I'm going to put it in your root work, so don't stress over it. Just listen. Jeremiah 49.22 says, Look, an eagle will soar and swoop down. So this is, remember, Jeremiah is a prophet into, into Israel, and he's basically warning them, okay, of what's to come. He said, An eagle will soar and swoop down, spreading its wings over Basra. In that day, the hearts of Edom's warriors will be like the heart of a woman in labor. And then Obadiah, as well as a prophet, Obadiah 1.4, says, Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from here I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Okay? So in all of those things, we see other, other pictures in Scripture where you have, you have in Psalms, too, where it talks about man rising up as an eagle, basically um, displaying pride and trying to gain their own power. And so what he's saying here, as an eagle, I will, I will swoop down and I will bring you down, okay, in my judgment. And then we see God's protection, which we know this one more often than not. But Exodus 19, 4 says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. There's Exodus again. And now I bore you, Israel, on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Okay, so it's the eagle of warning and judgment, or he can be the eagle of protection. I, we all know this scripture is what I meant earlier. We know more than not. Isaiah 40, 31. You know this probably by heart. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not be faint. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. When we trust in the Lord, when those, who, those whose hope is in the Lord, you will soar with wings like eagles, right? Or run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Those are those pictures I think so many times too, and personally, just side note, when I've walked through things that I'm struggling and you're like, Pah! and and you sit there and logically you can go, how in the world are you functioning right now? <laughs> you know, this is really hard. And you just feel like the Lord is carrying you. You know, where it's like, yes, that's the circumstance is still difficult. But when you have the, the hope and the peace of God carrying you through those circumstances where it's like, I can run a little bit farther. I can push a little bit harder. I can do, you know, I can persevere a little bit more. You can't explain that unless you walk through that. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. When your hope is in the Lord, when he is your all in all, he carries us. You've ex I know a lot of you have experienced this where you're just like, logically, it doesn't make sense. But I know because I'm being held and, and carried through this. It's like a, just a peace. It's really, it's beautiful to see God's word come to life in your life. You know, just, it's incredible. All right, so let's look at this word that is repeated three times. Three times. If you were with me in Isaiah, okay, this is huge because Isaiah said, whoa, more than any other prophet. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. When things are repeated twice, it's important. When things are repeated three times, you better pay attention. Okay, this is huge. So this whoa, what does whoa mean, ladies? Unnecessary tragedy. This does not have to happen. Okay, a woe is means, he's saying, brace yourself. Brace yourself, brace yourself. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But this didn't have to happen, right? Unnecessary tragedy, unnecessary tragedy. But I want to say too, every time where you see the word woe in scripture, in the context of what it's talking about, it always goes hand in hand with grace. It always goes hand in hand with grace. Again, that is the character of your God. That's who he is. That always goes hand in hand with grace. I put in your consequence of your rejection of me. This is like God speaking. My word and my warnings, those who live, to those who dwell on the earth. I want you to underline or highlight to those who dwell on the earth or those who live on the earth, some of our translations say. And the actual word live means to dwell. Now, when we say dwell, I love this word. I love probably one of my most favorite words in all of scripture because it's like, I'm gonna make a home here. I'm going to inhabit here. I'm not gonna move from this. I'm dwelling. And it always takes me back, and I love, you know, Philippians 4.8. When I talk about Philippians 4.8, it, whatever's true, whatever's right, whatever's love, whatever's pure, whatever is of good repute, whatever, whatever's worthy of praise, dwell on the, and NASB says that, New King James says it, dwell on these things. Dwell. It says you live there. You make your home there. Those are the things you meditate in your mind, okay? So in that same context, look here and see those who dwell on the earth Those who cling, this isn't a negative connotance here. Those who dwell, those who cling to the things of the earth, that's who he's talking to here. Where you've made your home here, that's who he's talking to. This is a warning that was given that the next three trumpets would be more severe than the first ones. The triple woe, (laughs) the announced by an eagle of the coming judgment, says it's only going to get worse. But I still am the eagle who saves, who protects. I pronounce judgment, but I also protect and save. This is an unnecessary tragedy. God is saying, I've done everything I could for this not to happen. Those who live, those who dwell, those who inhabit it, those who settle, who've made their home on earth. Okay, so as I looked at this, you know, as you go through Blue Letter Bible, if you haven't, I'll, tell, I'll show you how to do that if you're new, but this was incredible because if you look at the scriptures, you click on a scripture or a verse that you want to know the, the, na- or the, the words, you scroll down to the bottom, and it shows you every verse that that same word is used in. Okay, y'all know what I'm talking about. All right, so what was really cool about this is this dwell on the earth, the dweller of the earth, you scroll it down and you just look at the book of Revelation. This is, this is uh, announced 12 times, the dweller of the earth. And I'm going to read them for you, which is really cool and really powerful. Um, and, and I want to pull this out and have you see, if you were not convinced already, we are going to be gone. Prayerfully, you will be after we go through these verses. Um, but before we do, I want to refresh our, or just refresh our minds. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5. And the reason why I want you to look at this scripture first is I want you to understand this woe, this woe, 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 is not for who? Not for us. If you were here during um, the beginning of Revelation, or if you've listened to it yet, and why we believe what we believe as far as what happens with the rapture, please go back and listen to that. This will go hand in hand with it. But let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, what is that? What's the day of the Lord? Okay, it starts during, okay, what? Rapture time, when the, when the, the saints are brought up. All right. The day of the Lord will come like what? A thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. 
But you, brethren, are not in darkness. Hmm, imagine that. We just talked about the light, right? The day that the day it would take overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do not do, uh, do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on, put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet and the hope of salvation. For God, here we go, has not, what? Destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, whether we're dead or alive, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another. Therefore, we what? Encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. I cannot help every time I read that scripture to remember the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> I cannot help it because as the, the disciples were sitting there and Jesus was going back and telling them, stay awake, stay awake. Remember that? Be alert, be alert. And then he goes back to the Father and he prays. And how many times does he do that? Three times. What did I say three reminded of? Ah! I can't help it. I can't. Okay. What? Man, resurrection. Okay. The only way that can happen is through who? Jesus Christ, he goes back to the Father, and what does he do? He cries drops of blood. He prays, right? He sweats drops of blood, goes back again, stay awake, goes back, and then he realizes, okay, Father, not what? Not my will, but yours be done, okay? And then who comes like a thief in the night? Judas comes like a thief in the night, right? As Jesus is going back and forth, and he surrenders to the Father, and he realizes there's no other way that I can get man and God and, and bridge the gap. I am the only way. Do you see that? The way gets deeper and deeper. I'm the only way. I'm the only one who can do this. Not my will, but yours be done. And he submits to the Father and goes to the cross. Just beautiful. But all of that picture is stay awake. It's exactly here. I'm, he's coming again like a thief in the night. Just like the simile of when Judas came like a thief in the night. Right? It's incredible. See the... Puzzle, I'm just giving you like a diary of the mouth version of this, but go back, go back and listen to that. It's in Mark. It's incredible, but that's what he's doing, and it's just, it's just awesome. Okay, so then let's look at, if you want to go there with me, Revelation chapter 3, 10. And you should highlight these. Like if you put them in one color, a specific color, or go back and do it during your quiet time, during your root work, it's really cool to see all this parallel and overlap. Revelation 3.10 says, Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. That hour, that time period, which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Okay, underline it. Dwell on the earth. Those who dwell on the earth. Those are earth dwellers. We're not earth dwellers, okay? We're not earth dwellers. Revelation 6.10. Be a quick flip. Revelation 6.10 says, And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood to those who dwell on the earth? Okay? Those who dwell on the earth. Who was speaking in Revelation 6.10? Do you remember? The tribulation saints, right? Saying, how long, Right? Well, this, he says, wait, stay, keep, hold out just a little bit longer, okay, till all of you come to me. All right, then Revelation 8, 13, right where we're at. Then I look and heard an eagle flying in the mid heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to those, what, underline it, who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. <sighs> Then Revelation 11.10, right there, underline it. To those and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. They're talking about the two witnesses that will be killed. Um, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to, the, to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Dwell on the earth. Revelation 12.12. 12 says, for this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe, this is in the original language, saying woe to those 
to, um, it says to the earth and sea, but to those who dwell on the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. Can I just make a little bit of a note here? Everything we're studying is pointing to the fact that the devil, what does it say here? He knows what? He only, yeah, his time is short. So remember that every time you come to Bible study and there seems to be headaches and problems and traffic and all kinds of craziness, come anyway. <laughs> come anyway. Submit to the Lord, okay? Because he does not want you to be here. And the fact that you're here, praise God, because he will do whatever he can to keep you here. It's not a coincidence that things get a little bit difficult before you leave the house for Bible study, to study Revelation. It's not. It's not a coincidence. Push through. If that hasn't happened to you, it will, I guarantee it. <laughs> keep pushing through. Um, okay, so Revelation 13, 8. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name is not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. Isn't that pretty cool? No matter what, those who still, they, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whew. All right, Revelation 13, 12. It says, he exercises all all authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast who is fatal. This is talking about the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet. But he's talking about how he makes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship him. Okay, whose fatal wound was healed. That's going to be really interesting when we get there, by the way. All right, thir Revelation 13, 14 says, and he deceives those who what? Dwell on the earth because of the signs which is given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. There's his mimicking we're going to talk about. Revelation 14, 6. Again, it's going to be in your root work if you can listen to me. Revelation 14, 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in midheaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live, what? or dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. Okay, we're in Revelation 17. Guess what? Guess what that is? God's unfathomable, unfair grace. He's still sharing the gospel, okay? Revelation 17, 2. Re Revelation 17, 8 says, The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction for those who what? Dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the earth, of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was, <laughs> they will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. All right, so who are these who dwell on the earth? Who are they? Uh, the unbelievers, right? If there was not more of a witness, you notice it does not, it does, after Revelation when the church is taken up, do you realize that the church is never mentioned at all throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, except for the prayers of the saints that are before the throne? They're, they're not on the earth. Those who dwell on the earth are all unbelievers. And if you know anything about scripture, there's no coincidence at all, ever. It always paints a beautiful picture. And we as the church are not earth dwellers, right? Where's our home? In heaven, this is not our home. We are just passing through. We are what? We're going to see in 1 Peter 2.11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. And then Philippians, go with me there. Philippians 3. Starting 18, it says, For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Here we go for 20. For our citizenship. So wait a minute. 19 just explain who dwellers of the earth are. <laughs> okay, those whose ends are destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame. So who set their minds on earthly things. Those are earthly dwellers. Who set their minds on earthly things. Then 20, for our citizenship is where? In heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who will, 
transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the extension of his power and that he has give he has even in subject all things to himself hmm we're going to get glorified bodies too it's all going to be over everything every autoimmune disease praise the lord is gone i can't wait but our citizenship is not here permanently. Your position is in Christ and it's, it's sealed. Going back to the seal, your, your identification has been set, your position made, and no one can open or touch that seal except for who? Christ, right? All right, this is the question. So we know our citizenship is in heaven. Are we living that way? Oh, <sighs> breathe. Or are we living like earth dwellers? Are we living for this earth? Are we making this our home? Or are our eyes so fixed on eternity that our only focus is to get as many people there with us as possible? See, when we fix our eyes here, we dwell here, we make this our home, everything here becomes an idol to, above our God. Everything. Because guess what? You're like the women at the garage sale. I don't want it, but I don't want anybody else to have it. So I'm white knuckling everything. Anybody been garage sale? It's a fact. But, you know, this this white knuckling everything because they've made this. If I don't have, if I don't get, if I don't obtain, if I don't, I'm going to lose it all. And, And their lives are in fear. This is not our home. And the more that we live like that, the more loosely we will hold here. It's amazing. The more freedom we have to give, the more focused we are on the things that are eternal, right? So I put in here, what earthly or temporary thing or person are you holding so tightly to that you're not living in the freedom of being set apart for eternity? What person or what temporary or earthly thing are you holding so tightly to? You're not experiencing the freedom of being set apart for all eternity. I'll put that in your root work. You don't have to write it down. Huge questions. And I, and I guarantee, as you let the Lord reveal that, don't fight him. Let the Lord reveal that to you. There you will find some idols that need to be knocked down. Okay, things that are good things. These are the things that, man, sometimes it's like, well, of course, these are the most important things on the earth. Remember, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be married. We're not going to be parents. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So you can't say, well, it's family. Blood's thicker than water. Think about it. Think about it. All right, so real quickly, what does chapter 8, as a full, we just covered chapter 8, what does chapter 8 tell you about God? Who is God? Gracious, long-suffering. He's just. He's sovereign. He hears our prayers, right? Good. He's righteous. He's holy. He is good, so therefore, it is good, no matter what it is, right? Right? What did he do for me? Based on chapter 8, what did he do for me? Mm -hmm. Love beyond our capacity to understand. (laughs) He made me look up. That's awesome. Yes, save me from his wrath. He's protected us, right? He didn't destine us for wrath. He made a way, right? Okay, so then knowing those things, who am I? Who am I? I'm his beloved, right? What else? Child of the king. Redeemed. Saved. Safe. Set free, right? And I am going home soon, right? I am not a citizen of this world. 
I am not a citizen. So what do we need to do? What do we see? In the beginning of chapter 8, we saw the, the prayers of the saints rising up. What do we need to do knowing that? Don't stop praying, right? And when you pray, view those prayers as a fragrant aroma to the Lord that he sees and he knows, right? Make sure that vessel's clean. Confess that sin. Repent quickly and, and pray and share. Share the hope you have in Christ. I put here, never stop praising. Live with eternity in view. I love, I say this all the time, I love Leonard Ravenhill. Stamp eternity on my eyeballs. Stamp eternity on my eyeballs. That that's the only thing that I see. I'll keep everything else in view. Don't hold things of this earth too tightly, right? Hold it loosely. Hold it loosely. This is not my home. I'm just passing through. I don't belong here at all. I don't even like this view. This is not my home. So much darkness in this place. I don't belong here. This insanity of a rat race. This is not my home. I'll be going soon. I'm just waiting for that trumpet sound. I'm just waiting for my groom. Hold tightly my heart. He is coming soon. Hold tightly to him, for his very name is truth. I will keep my lamp lit. I will keep my eyes lifted high. This is not my home. Soon I will meet him in the sky. Heavenly Father, God, I praise you that this is not our home. God, you have adopted us and you have, you have set us apart for eternity. Our citizenship is in heaven. And Father, I pray, God, that you put that in the forefront of our eyes, God, that you keep uh, our perspective clear. You give us the lens of your character and your attributes that are true and right and holy. And God, you give us a passion and a desire to bring as many people with us into heaven as possible. Lord, the freedom we have in you is unbelievable. And I praise you for that. God, you are, you are pure and you are holy and you are just and you are righteous no matter what. Lord, help us, God, to judge our circumstances in light of your character and to not judge our God based on the circumstances we just don't understand. Lord, give us the right perspective. Give us a longing to earnestly seek your word, to earnestly seek your face, and to earnestly obey the things that you have set out for us, God. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for this body and these women. God, you have plucked us. You've picked us up and you've plucked us and you've put us right here for such a time as this, as we get to join arm in arm all the way into eternity. We love you, Lord, and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys.